Hello? Hello? Unmute yourself. Turn on your video if you can. Hello? Is that better? I hear you. Awesome. Don't... Who's this? Tommy? This is, yeah, this is Tommy. All right. What's going on? Well, yeah, so uh, just generally wondering about this whole IP thing um, and just trying to understand it practically, whether or how it would uh, apply and say my are life. You, had let work. me ask you, are you, uh, yeah. are you a libertarian? Uh, no, I guess. Um, I definitely like the philosophy, but to me, it's more like uh, Christianity in the sense of like it's a good rule to follow, but um, that's okay. I'm just trying to get so. Do you, uh, are you, do you, uh, do you favor property rights and free markets and capitalism basically as a general thing? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And, uh, but within that, just trying to understand, yeah, no, no, sorry, I'm just try trying to, to yeah. I'm just trying to see what you, uh, what you believe so I can go from those shared, uh, shared ideas. So if you're in favor of, so I guess as a normal person and as a Westerner, you're in favor of daddy. You know, hello. You're in favor of innovation, prosperity, freedom, free markets, competition, capitalism. That kind All of that. stuff, right? Yes, okay. sir. So hold on a second. All right. So the idea, the the idea is that um what you want is you want to have a system where private property rights are, are, are defined and respected widely in society. So everyone gets to keep and use their property, right? And that includes their body, which is self-ownership, and other things in the world, okay? And the other things in the world are all these scarce resources out there that we need to use to live, like land and food and, and other resources, right? Yes, sir. So you have to have property. You have to have that's not me. I don't, I don't know what's going on there. So you have to, you have to, uh, um, so, so you have property rights is what defines who owns these resources. Okay. So every, every political system out there has an answer to the question who owns a given resource that's in dispute, right? Like a factory or your car or your house or your body. So, if your body's in question, the answer is you own your body. Okay, so that's who we don't believe in slavery. So for other things, we have basically two oh, simple rules. Are. Okay, I'm gonna ban this guy. Uh, he left. Okay, so um, you have two basic simple rules. One is homesteading, which is the first person who uses something that's unowned in the world is the owner of it. Okay. And then the second rule is contract. Like if you if an owner of that thing gives it to someone else, then now they're the owner. So that's basically all of private law can be worked out from those principles. So whenever there's a dispute over a resource, you simply ask, who had it first? And did did you get it from someone who owned it by contract? Okay. You with me? Yeah, I'm with you there so far, but I, I can see how my question of IP kind of falls into that first part though. As far as homesteading and the work you put yeah. into something. No, it's not about uh, work. It's not about work, and it's not about um, – it's about scarce resources. That's things in the world that we could have a conflict over because the whole purpose of property rights is to let you have security in using a resource without someone else taking it from you. And they can only take it by physical force, and you need to use physical control over it to use it. Well, so, I, I don't necessarily agree with that, though. Okay. Um, uh, again, in the premise that I kind of put out up there on Twitter, as far as you know, whether you steal the welder out of the back of my truck or the plans for cold fusion out of the, my safe that I was spent ten years and my resources and savings on to come up with, but that, to me, I, well, I, I don't see a practical difference in the damage you're doing to me. Like, there, there's, there's not, there's not. That's why, that's why you can't steal, you can't go into someone's house and steal something from their safe. But that's not intellectual property. That's just property rights. 
you own so, your safe. You own the paper. People people don't have the right to come into but, your house and use it. Use but it do you owe me for the price of the paper that you stole, or for the information and the profits you're able to generate off that information? For for the for the latter, for the greater number. That's how the law works, and that's how the law should work. But that's okay, not how so, the property. So, okay, well then maybe I'm just ignorant on IP then, which no, I no, definitely which, could be. Like, so I don't I don't know if you read through. The back and forth I was having with the other guy on Twitter, Toad or something. <laughs> well, I, I, I saw like... some of it. I, I saw some of it. Look, I think what he said was there's no right to a profit, and he's right about that. But that's not my point. Like, just because there's no guarantee to profit doesn't mean there can't be damages. Correct. Like, I, I'm not guaranteed correct, a profit, correct, but if I can correct. show that you damaged me in a way, correct. You know, one doesn't no, negate the other. Yeah, and your instincts are right. Your instincts are right, but the reason you brought the question up, um, the reason you brought the question up in a in a discussion about IP is because there's a natural assumption, there's a natural argument people make um, where if you admit that you can get damages for the value of what's written on the paper, then you're conceding the case for intellectual property because you're saying, well, information is valuable, therefore it's property. But that's the that's the false step, and you're not necessarily making that step. But that's why I'm I'm quick to say, um, you can have a property right in the paper, and you can have a right to claim damages based upon what was on the paper if someone stole it from your house, because that's how consequential damages work in a lawsuit. But so but that, so we're just arguing about semantics at this point, whether. It, like, it's not semantics. It's I, I want to. I just want to be clear that that granting that you can have damages for a tort based upon the value of the thing does not imply intellectual property. So it's not semantics. It's saying that you still can't have patent or copyright law, but you can have so property law. How would you How would you classify the information on that piece of paper that was stolen from me, if not by just saying IP? <laughs> How would you, um, you classify that to uh, to claim judgment on someone? You wouldn't. You don't okay. have to classify it. All you have to do is you have to say that in the in the real world, the reason people don't want their property taken is because it has value to them. It has value to them because of, of its unique properties. So, you know, suppose I have um, um, a, a, a paperback book which is only worth, you know, only costs ten dollars, but my grandmother gave it to me, and she's dead. And so I value that book a lot. So I subjectively value that book. I don't want someone to steal it from me. So I have it in my house protected from thieves for that reason. So if someone breaks into my house and takes it from me, they've taken a book that I value for my own personal reasons. So they've harmed me more than if they just took uh, another book, which was just a cheap book you can replace easily from the supermarket. Yeah, but that value to you is subjective versus correct. Like, but that's versus how that, like my business. Correct. Right. The, the well, no. So, so, so in Austrian, profits, no, in Austrian price. economics, in Austrian economics, all value is subjective. There is no objective value. But if someone becomes a criminal explain, or an aggressor, uh, explain that a little more. Cause I, I have a hard time understanding the difference. Oh, I'm sorry. Objective versus uh, when, like, I can prove, say, hey, I was making X profit. They stole right. this information, and my profit dropped by half. That doesn't seem subjective to me. But maybe I'm it's, just misunderstanding your. No, you're, you're right. You're right in sensing. The, you're sensing a problem, and the problem is that value is subjective. But the other problem is that when there's an act of crime or a tort, uh, someone's rights have been violated, and it's literally impossible to make them to, to undo the crime. You can't undo the offense that you committed against them. But so all you can do is an imperfect remedy to try to make them whole as best you can right so like if someone murders your your wife if they pay you five million dollars that doesn't make you whole but what else can they do they can't bring her back to life so all you can do in those situations because the criminal has put you in a position where you have a set of imperfect remedies in front of you so if someone harms someone in your family or harms you you can't undo what they did to you but what you can do is you can do something so you could punish them, you could forgive them, you could enslave them and make them work it off. You could make them do something to get forgiveness. You could make them pay you money. There's lots of things you could do. And in my view, the law should give utter, uh, the, should give maximum flexibility to the victim to craft the remedy that he thinks best satisfies him, knowing to that none of those. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, vic okay. the, vic the victim should should be able to choose whether the victim wants to forgive the guy or or punish the guy or have the guy pay him money. But if he asks for money, it's got to be according to some reasonable standard. It can't just be totally open ended. So all we can do is say, OK, fair market value, which is an imperfect standard, but there's nothing else you can do. So so the paper, if someone steals your, your secret from your safe, if it's a blank piece of paper, they've only harmed you a tiny amount because you're you can easily go replace that paper with ten dollars or a dollar. Right. But if they take the paper with a secret formula and they broadcast it to the world and that harms the business opportunities you would have had by keeping it secret, then they cause you millions of dollars of damage, and then they owe you a higher amount because the consequences of their tort was greater to you. So they have to do as best they can to make you whole. So that's why the damages will be higher in the case where they where they took something. Yeah, so, I, I understand all. Yeah, I understand that. I, I'm still kind of just lost on why uh, the classification of the theft of paper with information on it wouldn't be classified as IP versus just you're saying just like you we would because, just want to practically look at damages because because a, because IP means that IP means yeah, you own that might be own, the issue maybe I misunderstand IP and that's so IP think in the case you're giving it would probably be cop it, it would probably be copyright okay so um so in the case of copyright if you own the formula on that paper if someone copies it even if you make it public, you can stop them from copying it. But they haven't committed – they haven't broken into your house and done anything wrong. So the question of damages only comes up when someone has done something wrong to you. If they copy information you gave them, they're not doing anything wrong. And when you publish a book, you're giving information to the world. You're, you're making it public. Correct. Right? You, can keep, yep. you can keep something secret, but if you make it public, you can't complain that people learn from it and use it. Right. Let me give you another example. Suppose yeah. you come up with if you come up with a better mouse trap, well, you can keep it secret and you can make a mouse trap for yourself and catch mice better than other people. But if you want to make money from it, you need to sell it. So you're going to make uh, you're, you're going to make 10,000 copies of it. You're going to sell it on the free market. And when you sell it, people are going to see what you did and they're going to learn from that. And you might have competitors start implementing your innovative designs in their mouse traps because you told them how to do it. Yeah, for sure, but that's that's different than like the scenario that I laid out as far as like it is. the secret scenario. It is. It is different. Yeah. Yeah. That's why the scenario you laid out can be handled by regular contract and property principles, but you don't need intellectual property to handle that and that's that's why it doesn't imply that see a lot of people try to say that well, if you deny intellectual property, you're saying that value is not worth it, that information is not worth anything. But you just admitted information is worth something because you right. said the damages are greater in the case case of theft. Does that does that help clear it up a little? That clears it up a lot, actually. Thank you. Hey, uh, is that Orlando or Tommy? That wasn't me. No, it wasn't me. Okay, that's Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I, I guess I'm learning something. You, you don't let people in if they're gonna. Uh, I mean, yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually here to learn, though. I'm actually here to learn. <laughs> Be smart ass. I mean, yeah, I'm kind of a smart okay. ass, you know, like, but it's, I mean, it's fine. Like, I'm a big fan. All right. Are you still there, sir? I'm still here. Go ahead. If anyone okay. else, if you have more questions, go ahead. Or if anyone else has questions, go ahead. Uh, no, uh, that's, I guess I just need to read up on my understanding uh, get a better understanding of ip then because it seems like we both are in agreement that there's damages and the disagreement is whether the damages come about from ip versus just uh, I, I don't know how to classify it any other way than ip but stolen information. well so the reason the guy I, said I, I, the reason the ahead. guy said responding to you said you don't have a right to a profit is because um so, so let's suppose you start a pizza restaurant and you're expecting profit from the customers. And if someone else starts competing with you, um, if someone starts competing with you, you're going to make less profit than you expected. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't apply to my the scenario that I laid out. I, I understand Correct. that profits aren't guaranteed, but this is main damages can occur. This was my reply to him. Yeah. Um, so, um, and it. I'm glad that we both agree that in that scenario that damages have occurred because to me he was trying to argue that there were no damages because 
IP or whatever you want to call it didn't exist. And he he might me, be, he, he might be concerned that if you say that if you say that there's damages for what's on the paper, this would it, this could be used by intellectual property advocates to say, well, there's a right to a profit or there's a right to the information. So yeah, some people, they're they're afraid to, they're afraid of where people are going to take that concession, but that's why I try to make a lot of uh, careful distinctions so that you can distinguish one case from the other. Fair enough. And, uh, so that article that you linked to, uh, not the commie inside one, but the uh, your personal article that kind of go more into detail of what we spoke that, about. Oh, that's not that's not commie inside. That's just a graphic that was come from it. If you click on it, um, there's an article about why harm, like like harm itself, is not the standard for a tort. Uh, the standard for a tort has to be physical invasion. That is the physical violating the physical integrity of someone's property. But once you do that, then they have to pay you some kind of restitution or damages. And the only way to figure that out is to ask, well, what are the consequences to the victim of what I did? And that can that can that can differ depending upon the nature of the of the thing done to them. So if I take a blank piece of paper from you and some ink, it only hurts you so much. If I take you know your your private notebook with your secret formula in it that hurts you in a different way so you can take the the nature of the of the tort into account when you formulate the damages that are owed but but, but the article of yours that you said you written in 1996 or something like that is that no oh the, oh to... that that one's about that one's about um uh, about what our rights are and what rights we have to respond to a to an aggressor when they could, when they violate your rights, and in that article, I try to explain that the the victim has the right to choose between as many possible options as he can to make him whole because value subjective. So one person, I mean, let's let's say a woman is is sexually assaulted, you know, she might want to rape the have the guy raped back. She might want vindictive. She might want retribution. She also might want to have nothing to do with something like that. She might want to have the guy punished uh, in jail, or she might want the guy to just pay her money, or she might want the guy to issue a public apology. So whatever she wants that best satisfies her is what she should be able to get within the bounds of proportionality. So that's what I argue in that paper. Okay. Yeah, so I – Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Anyone else want to want to talk? Nolan or Ed? I do you have a few questions for you? Why don't you go first, Nolan? And then if you have a All question. Right, sure. Can you hear me okay? Uh, you're a little muddy, but I'll try Hold to on. make it out. All right. So uh, I was reading an article earlier. I think it was from like 2007. This doesn't. Is it okay? Do you want to stay on topic of intellectual property, or can I ask you something else? I don't care. Anything's fine. Okay. So you're talking about the, the blocky improviso or proviso or however you pronounce that, but um, with this whole forestalling thing. And yeah, my question was, I I don't think that I, I don't. I'm not really a big fan of his whole forestalling thing. I don't think it makes a ton of sense. Is do you have any ethical justification as to why you know? buying out a bunch of land around somebody some abandoned land within it is wrong or do you just think that i mean i think that wouldn't happen just for economical issues like that doesn't make any sense why yeah. and i would see why uh, people would okay. contract to make that not the case but anyway yeah you're you're siloning a little but i think i got are you talking about walter block or frank van dunn yeah. i think it's walter block right yeah walter block with the, the donut problem yeah um i've got a whole uh, article or blog post um, disagreeing with Walter on that point, so I go into in detail um, into why I disagree with him on that. But yeah, I agree with you. First of all, economically, it's not a uh, practically it's not a problem for the same reason that it's not a problem to have one monopolist buy up the whole world or to have someone you know own the whole country. Um, those just aren't they're not going to realistically arise. Um, and uh, yeah, I think Walter's reasoning is just not – it just doesn't follow. I think he has some kind of idea that um, just as nature abhors a vacuum, 
libertarian theory abhors unowned property or something like that. I don't even know what, what kind of argument that's supposed to be. It's an argument from metaphors like libertarianism is not based upon what the theory abhors. I mean, that's just not an argument. Oh, yeah. So nice. if you if you own a donut shaped ring of property and people are not able to get to the inside and homestead it, that's not a crime against libertarian theory. Only crimes can only be committed against other people. Number one, so the only person you could be committing a crime against of that center part of the donut is the owner of it. But by definite, by, by by definition, there's no owner, so there's no one that you could be committing a crime against. Um, and what I would say actually is that if you have some kind of hermetically sealed situation like that, where the interior of this donut. You've totally encircled it so no, so that no one else can ever reach it. Then you've effectively homesteaded it yourself. You are the owner of it. That's what I would say, uh, because ownership is actually setting up borders or embordering something or boundaries, and that's what you've done. You've encircled something. You put a fence around it, basically. So I think the hypothetical is just weird. Um, th there is no, there's no, there's no crime. Now, if, if you're not using it, someone can helicopter over it and go there and get it. You know, then they can homestead it that way, which is why it's not okay. really even a problem. Okay. okay. If, if there is some owner A that owns the, the donut hole, and then some owner B, um, you know, bought all around that hole, say, and and above it and below it, and they they physically can't get out. Or is there? Do you see any ethical issue with that? Um. Sure. Uh, and in fact, I put in the in my response, I, I, I went to the civil law articles in the in, in the civil law codes, um, and I think the common law deals with this too. There are practical solutions that have already been worked out and they're they're roughly libertarian compatible as far as I can tell. So what like what the civil law says is that um, if you own a plot of land and you allow it, you allow yourself to be encircled by people. So so let's say that you you're you're totally enclosed except for one one driveway that lets you get out and then yeah. you sell that land to someone else. Well, you've done it to yourself. So you can't complain. Now I need a right of way to get out. But I, the law says that if, if other people in, totally encircle you, uh, I think there's some provision where you have to be given um, the most convenient or easiest right of way to get to the next road or something like that. So, but it, not in, in all states. No, I don't know if it's in all states, but I'm just saying yeah. I'm using it as, as an example of what so some laws access do. Access law is what you're referring to. Yeah, and, and, and Louisiana has it, but yeah. But well, yeah. Louisiana, I'm from, I'm from Louisiana, so I was going with the Louisiana Civil Code. I know I know how they deal with it, and their solution seems roughly reasonable to me. Um, but I think in practice, it would be like um, it's the same argument. Walter Block is good on this. Like he, he's good on on roads should not be public, and you don't need eminent domain to make roads. You can have private roads, and people say, "Well, how am I going to get to the store?" And the answer is, "Well, if someone's going to build a store, they're going to make sure people can get to you." <laughs> so there's an incentive for for businesses to make sure by buying up rights of way or whatever they have to do, people to be able to get to you. People oh. want to want to want to want to want to move around. They want to commute. Yeah. Uh, I, I get the I get the practical argument of it that of, of course this isn't going to happen. People are going to contract so that you know you're not surrounded by stuff all around you. That doesn't make any sense in the first place. But the question was more so, yeah, I, I, I get was what you were saying that um, the contracts that you could potentially sign up for or sign with follow libertarian theory, or is it that the axioms? produced by libertarian theory lead you to some certain conclusion that that would be wrong. Like Walter Block, he tries to say that you can't prevent somebody from getting somebody else because, you know, based on some derivin, derision from property rights. Do you have that same thing no. with some other reasoning or no? No. I, in fact, I think okay. that um, I think it's confused because, okay. you know, if you look at the earth as a spherical surface, uh, you know, if you draw a ring on it, then there's an inside and there's an outside, but really there's no difference between the inside and the outside. I mean, you could say that um, uh, that if I have a donut, I'm preventing people on the outside from getting to that side of it, you know. Or, or really, what the argument's getting at is the is the kind of leftist, left libertarian concern with with property right in land, and there are some concerns they have that are not 
completely wrong. So, uh, and and like Hans Hermann Hoppe, who's in, who's a very strict kind of right libertarian, he argues, and I agree with him, that property rights um, can be formed number one in groups, and they can be formed in less than full ownership of a resource. So, for example, if you have a group of people in a town, and they they have a a, a regular path they use to get down to the river, then they homestead a right of way, a right of passage over that over that path. Um, and so, if you were to put up a wall and prevent them from using that path, then you're violating the, the property right that they've gathered over time. And so, what you could argue is that the enclosure movement in 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 England, where you had peasants and farmers who could roam the land and hunt. Okay, but then people also had a house there, and then all of a sudden they put up walls preventing people from crossing. Violates the pro the the property rights of these farmers and I'm sorry the hunters because they previously had a right of way to use the land for that purpose. And I believe in some countries like Italy, they explicitly recognize that that like even if you have a house and you own the land, you can't stop hunters from using it from pre pre existing usage rights. So in this way, rights can be right to roam. I believe is what you're referring to. Yeah, I think uh, it's something like that. It's right to yeah. roam and also the right to hunt. In fact, there's something like this in the – everyone talks about the Magna Carta, but there was a, a previous agreement that kind of goes along with it called the Forest Charter, which which recognized the rights of these hunters to hunt in the woods. And like if the king's men came, they had to blow a horn to warn everyone they're there, so they re sort of recognized this. So there is something to the fact that establishing rigid property rights in land all of a sudden can – can eject people from their previous roaming rights, um, and that should be respected, of course. But that's because that's, of property rights. Beforehand, homesteaded that property, and then the other people who were say built a wall are you know infringing on that home. It would basically be their property in a sense, right? Is that the argument? Or am Correct. I it's just it's yeah. It's okay. just not it's not complete property over the land, but the right to use it in certain ways, uh, okay. which is called an easement. Or a usufruct or a right of way in the law. Another example would be um, the issue of pollution. Um, so, uh, if if I go into the wilderness and start a factory, and I'm polluting, well, I own the land that my factory's on, but I also have homesteaded a right to pollute for a given region around there. So, if someone then moves next to me, they can't complain that I'm polluting on their land because they they came to it. So they started owning their land subject to my easement to pollute over their land. But on the other hand, if we're neighbors and you start polluting, now you are violating my rights because you're polluting onto my land because I, I was there before. So it depends on who had it first. Yeah, it's the same as the Ralph Bardian airport argument, is it right? It's roughly compatible yeah. with what with Rothbard argues in his air pollution article in Cato in 1982. All right, uh, I've got a couple more questions, but if somebody else wants to ask something. I wouldn't mind jumping back uh, to the original topic real quick. Just Go ahead, Tommy. Um, so if we both kind of agree that damages occurred by the scenario I laid out, is it a misunderstanding on my part of IP or is it a misunderstanding on libertarian theory and how you would classify that scenario that I need to look more into? I'm not sure you have a misunderstanding. I think you're correct that if someone steals a valuable um, informational document from you, that they owe you some kind of damages based upon the nature but, but, of that document. My first gut reaction would be because of IP, but you're saying that's not IP. So is it my misunderstanding of the definition yeah. of IP versus um, yeah. I like it, a libertarian it, theory that I just ignored on? Yes, you're, it's your misunderstanding of IP because, because, um, I mean, let's suppose there's no there's no copyright, and there's no copyright law at all. Okay, so if someone yeah, and that's that's where I was kind of because we're me and the other guy were talking about in Capistan, right? Like maybe there might be some copyright law or whatever, but like I was just thinking about like a man that put his work and savings into something. And then some other man stole it from me, like to tell me yeah, that I don't yeah, have. I, a, I think your right I think, to react is absurd. 
you know. I think you're you're what you're doing is you're assuming that that's in a case of IP because you've heard so many times that IP rights or intellectual property is simply a property right in the value of information. So all you see is in this case, well, he sold something that had information on it. It was valuable to me, and I got an award of damages. So that's a case of IP, but it's not because because that the example you gave and that I agree with you on would apply even if there was no such thing as copyright because if you broke into my house and you stole my paper then i could get damages from you just because of the physical act of 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 trespass um it wouldn't have anything to do with ip um and and ip would apply to people that copy the information even when they don't trespass to do it like i said so if you make it public by publishing a novel and someone copies it they're not breaking into your house to take your book. They're reading the book that you gave them to read. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I get the difference. So it, like if you tell your priest or your accountant or your lawyer a secret, they're supposed to keep it private because of the confidential nature of the information and your relationship with them. And if they divulge it, you can sue them for breach of contract right? because they breached the relationship between you. But – if you make the information public to the world, who are you going to sue for using it because you told them it's no longer private information? Yeah, I, I, I understand that scenario for sure. Um, you know, like if you, if you tell if you tell your priest that you're that you're gay, and he and no one knows it, and he reveals it to the world, it could injure you. Like, let's say you're a famous actor or something, and you know you're Tom Cruise or something, you know, and. You, now you can't act anymore, and so you, you can sue him for consequential damages. But if you if you get drunk at a bar one night and you start telling all the guys in the room the truth, and soon the word spreads that you're gay, then it's not private information. So anymore. so so just my misunderstanding of the definition of IP then, uh, because uh, I would uh, practice the, uh, of the law, yeah, of what the law is and how copyright and patent work. It's just it's because it, it is hard to understand. So. Yeah, it's just your misunderstanding of what those laws are. Granted. But it's also partly the fault of the intellectual property advocates because they're dishonest. So what they do is they run around misdescribing the way it works, and they misdescribe, and they dishonestly portray my arguments, people like me, so it confuses people like you. So what they say is, well, if you're against intellectual property, you must be for plagiarism, or if you're against intellectual property, you must be for fraud. Or if you're against intellectual property, then there's no difference between stealing a blank piece of paper and stealing um, my secret notebook. See, and they're wrong. They, they're wrong about all these things. But it, it clouds the water, and so people like you who are just trying to figure it out get confused, which is totally understandable. So just with the try to just sum this all up the scenario i laid out like we don't classify it as ip you would just classify that as what type of theft well um, so, or, or so not necessarily does the theft not need to be defined just the damages need to be defined in that scenario yeah yeah and so when someone breaks into your home and steals something from your computer or your safe they are not committing an act of copyright infringement and they're not committing an act of patent infringement in fact, they can't be committing a patent infringement because patents are public, so this is presumably private information. Correct. So they're not committing yeah. copyright infringement. They're committing, they're committing trespass or, or conversion or theft. Um, so it's just not a – so it but they, property… But the information itself, you wouldn't so classify what, as IP. It, it just – So this is the… No, not a term for it, I guess, within… This, this is the problem with um, – with people that are sloppy with language. So, for example, people say hey, they I'm right own, there with that. <laughs> no, I, I'm not. I'm not blaming you for it. I'm. I'm. I'm saying that when when people aren't precise with terms, it leads to confusion and equivocation. So, for example, people say they own Bitcoin, but what they really mean is they they have the right, yeah. the ability to, to control it. But ownership and and control or possession are distinct distinct concepts in the law, and in political theory, uh, and and likewise. Um, um, Intellectual property refers to laws like patent and copyright law that try to protect people from 
the effects of other people copying or using their information. So intellectual property refers to a law, but people use it in a sloppy way to refer to information. So they'll okay. say something like they'll that. say they'll say something like um uh like if yeah, I have a new, my understanding a, was an idea versus yeah so they, they the legal they, standing I guess they're using they're using the word IP which should refer to the law or to the legal right they're using it to refer to the thing that the legal right tries to protect so they'll okay. say that, that, that makes they'll sense. say that um uh, you'll even hear people say like I have a business and and like someone wanting to invest in it say well what's your IP and you'll say well my IP is how I make lasers so. When they use IP, they just mean their their secret information, or their or their or the way they do things, their special sauce they call it sometimes. But IP really means legal rights, the patent and copyright laws. But even like the person that made lasers, they could have their employees sign a NDA or some sort yeah. of I don't know if NDA would be the correct term, but something to where yeah. they could take that. Yeah. Okay. Well, and that's actually implied by the by the employment agreement, even if you don't sign an employment agreement or a non disclosure agreement. Um, there's an there, there's an implied obligation of confidentiality, just like if you confess something to your priest or your doctor, um, they're supposed to keep that private. But usually they have an explicit written agreement preventing them from doing that, and that has to do with trade secrets and contract law, not with patent or copyright law. And that's confusing, but that's because IP law is confusing. Okay. And that's why the the proponents of it get away with their arguments because they just – oh, someone wants to screen share. Hold on a second. Um, all right, who's – Chris? Wait, Chris wants to share something. Chris, can you unmute for a second? Because I'm afraid you want to share something as a prank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he left. <laughs> 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 he asked me 10 times, please give me permission. I want to show, show something. Yeah, I have an idea what he wanted to show. Um, <laughs> and people, by the way, do the same thing with the word property. Um, like you'll say that car is my property, but technically speaking, the car is not your property. Technically speaking, you have a property right in the car. The car is an object that you have an ownership right in or a property right in. But over time, people get sloppy, and they'll say the car is my property. But technically speaking, that's not correct. The car is is a resource that you own. No, Chris wants back in. Uh, our, um, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, you're just jumping into as far as property versus an object that you have a property claim on. That's definitely deeper than I <laughs> my ignorance had known about before, but it makes sense. Um, yeah, I, and I can see how uh, people have used the term IP to kind of misconstrue it. To, well, they uh, use it because we have IP, we have intellectual property law, and so in today's economy and today's society, if you have a business and you have valuable um, – your business model is based upon, say, publishing books um, or selling software or artwork or movies or audio… Or you have um, inf you have inventions which could be patented. Typically, you would you would cover the artistic works with copyright, and you would cover the inventions with patents. And so, these 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 creative aspects of your business would be covered with IP. So people tend to start referring to them as "What's your IP?" But like in a libertarian society, you could still have a version of IP if everybody decided to sell books within a market they weren't they all decided they weren't gonna well you, you could do that but it wouldn't be ip if that would just be contracts between certain people i'm sorry but stephen Kinsella is live right now on zoom uh, yeah any <laughs> hey guys uh anyone can talk as long as you're not a prankster <laughs> um sorry i forgot what i was saying you guys can turn uh, your videos on if you want. My video is on. No one's got their video on. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I don't care. I would. I'm just, I'm just in the I'm middle of the night in a That's fine. condo That's fine. in Florida. <laughs> All right. Uh, what, what you were talking about was uh, the difference. It wouldn't be IP. It should be contract law as far as… Correct. As well as, so so yeah. when, when you say IP, it's intellectual property, mm -hmm. and property rights in the law was called NREM, which means 
as opposed to in persona. Rem means a real thing, arrests, a real thing. That's why we say real for real property, um, which means it's a right good against the world. So, for example, if you own a car or a house, you don't have to have a contract with everyone in the world for, for, it, to be, for it to be illegal for them to break into your house. It's a property right good against everyone, even if they don't agree. So that's what an in rem right or a property right is. It's a right that you have against everyone, against the whole world. But a contract right is only between people that have the contract. So it's just between A and B. So is that doesn't bind C? <laughs> Excuse my ignorance here, but like you're you're explaining the the term of real. Is that why it's called real estate versus? Yep, exactly. It's called contract to so, say there's something. Yeah, because the Latin word, the Latin word res, R-E-S, is in there, which means a real thing, or it means um, it means an object or a physical thing. So res, a res is a thing, and the word re goes into real, or like realtor, someone who sells property, real property, land, it's a realtor. Yeah. Okay. Realty, we have realty and personality. Cool. And in, in the civil law, that would be called corporeal, corporeal, having a body, like corp, corpus, like habeas corpus, or like yes, a sir. corpse. Like a corpse, so it's called corporeal. And then things that are not real or intangible or incorpor incorporeal. And in libertarian law, there's no such thing as rights in incorporeal because all rights are enforceable by physical force, and physical force can only be applied to real physical things. I wouldn't that's say why. that's why. Okay, what, what do you think? Because you need to apply the force to the person who's physical. I'll say because if it's intangible, then it is not real. It's like like it, you can have more than one, right? Like the, the thing is, yeah, property rights over things because they are they're scribble, right? Like I cannot have the same thing as you have at the same time. If it is tangible, but if it is not, then we can. So that's why we need property rights over tangible things over scarce resources. Yeah, but, but all these, because, all these, yeah, all these things but, have the feature. Because you need to apply that, force to me, not to the thing. So it doesn't matter if you can apply force to the thing. Yeah, ultimately you're right. It's about people's bodies, but, but when we when we act in the real world, we're we're human actors, and we have our bodies which we control, and we use those bodies to to intervene in the state of affairs in the world by employing what Mises calls scarce means. Okay, yeah. so a scarce means is something that can help you intervene causally in the world and because the world causally is a world of physical things these are all basically tools or resources that we grapple with and we control physically and those are the things that you can have conflict over you can have oh conflict. yeah i agree yeah i agree with that i'm just saying i didn't think that's why I, I i'll say it's because you need the resources to be scarce yeah what what i'm getting at is that it's literally impossible to have a property right in information yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. It's not. It's not that the law is unjust. It's that the law is impossible, um, because every, all rights are property rights, and, and all property rights are rights to control scarce resources that are physical, material things. Okay, which means that when you have an intellectual property law, it's not really the way it's described is as a right over ideas or information, but that's actually not true. That's not what the law really is. Okay, it's sort of like when people say um, we we have wars fought over religion. We don't really have wars fought over religion. What they mean is that religion is the reason that people fight. But when they fight, they fight over scarce things. Like when they fight, they physically kill each other's bodies and try to take each other's cattle and land and animals and women. You know, it's always physical things. But the reason they do it is because of religion, because of a disagreement. So they're confusing the motive for doing something with what the, with what the action is. And likewise, in the law, when there is a right, when there's a, and there's always a right that's a correlative of any law, um, the law is always aimed at, at assigning an owner. Some person is the owner of some resource that can be can, could be there could be conflict over. So in intellectual property law, it's not really assigning property rights and ideas. It's assigning property rights in scarce resources. So copyright basically gives a property right in someone else over my printing press. And the excuse is that they're taking my ideas, but that's just the motivation for the law or the justification for the law. But the law actually is an a reassignment of property rights 
in scarce resources. That's why all IP is theft because it takes people's property from the natural owner and gives it to someone else who didn't contract for it. Hey, hey Stephen, I'm gonna have to yeah. jump out. Uh, I did definitely want to thank you for your time. Um, you're, you're welcome. And, uh, I'll jump back in if I, if you're still on here in a minute. Thank you, sir. Sure. All right, sure. So I have a question for you. Have you ever thought of making a case against IP from argumentation ethics? So I'm saying, oh, you, you're gonna argue against the free flow of ideas because that'll be contradicting yourself. Oh, that's interesting. Because, um, uh, um, uh, by the way, um, I messaged you because I'm working on a paper with Professor Bagus with Philip. Okay. Yeah, um, so I'm developing this idea on the paper about like it, it is contradictory to, to go against the free flow of idea as well. You're arguing because <laughs> you're making an argument against acting upon what you've learned before while I have acting to, upon I, what you've learned I, before. I have to think about it. I'm sympathetic to it. I'm just not sure if you could make that rigorously. I mean, uh, I'm trying. Um, <laughs> I mean, I do think that a, pre, a presupposition of argumentation would be. Uh, the natural assignment of, of property rights in scarce resources, which would be homesteading and contract, and IP violates that rule. So that'd be the more direct route I would take. Oh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is something um, at least hypocritical about using ideas freely and then saying people can't use them freely. Um, and you could also make a similar argument. You could say that um, everyone – necessarily uses information that others have come up with without their permission because you can't even right. communicate without without language and right. you, didn't invent, exactly, you didn't invent the language exactly you didn't invent and the language and 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 if you have clothes and you, you you ate food that sustained you to get there you're using techniques of cooking and clothes making that other people came up with just to survive and to have the argument in the first place and so, yeah, it'd be like saying, up until today when I'm having this argument, there was no IP, but starting now, there's going to be yeah. IP. Yeah, it's hypocritical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what I think, too. Because I, I, I don't know. I thought it was pretty say you never made that argument before. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, right the, the thing is the, – the thing is – Intellectual property is a flawed and wrong argument, so there's – I guess there's theoretically an infinite number of ways to disprove it because oh, – yeah, yeah, that's exactly something... what we were doing in the paper. We have yeah. the natural law case against IP, the yeah. argumentation ethic case, and then the utilitarian case. It's like me. There's no way to defend this thing. I just try to be careful in rigorously extending argumentation ethics because some people are too fast and loose with it like um, – even Frank Van Dunn, who I like and admire, um, who defended yeah. it very well, he he makes some arguments that I think take it too far. Like I think you could use a version of argumentation ethics to make some ethical or moral arguments, but they're not really about political norms anymore. So you could you could make you could use argumentation ethics to make a case for the virtue of honesty, for example, because the goal of argumentation is to pursue truth, right? Which is related to honesty. So you could you could make an argument that you can't make a sincere argument for dishonesty because it's contrary to the to the endeavor or the goal of argument, which is to get at the truth. So, right. you know, so but that's not really about political norms in force. That's just about ethical. So Frank Van Dunn tries to argue that um, you you can't you can't you can't fire. What's he say? You can't fire your opponent's son if he works for your for your company because you can't say you better accept my argument otherwise I'll fire your son from working for my company because you're coercing him into accepting your argument from something other than the force of reason so what's that supposed to prove that there are employment rights that you can't be fired I mean so <laughs> you got to be careful not to go too far with the argumentation ethic um, I try to keep it strictly to the non-aggression principle and property rights stuff but I think you're your your extension to IP, like the ways we just discussed, could have some merit if you're careful about it. I like it. All right. Well, 
Tapi dia I think I might have discussed you with with uh, Philip. I think we talked briefly a couple of times by email in the last few months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He told me about it. I yeah. messaged you last night, two minutes ago. I don't remember when I messaged you again, but I think you missed that. Because Philip told me to to show you the draft version of what we had, uh, in case you wanted to also take part in it. And uh, I. I don't remember that, but try to send it again. I had, I had a, a big backlog of. Was it by email? Yeah. Is yeah, I had, at, I had a, I had a, I had a big backlog email of emails, time? and um, about every year or two, on accident, I archive my inbox instead of one of the other tabs, and then I've lost all my, all the email that was in my inbox, which I'm using as a reminder. So, I, that might be what happened. I lost about. 50 emails the other day. I didn't lose them, but I archived them, so I don't know what was, was waiting for me to get to. So feel free to send it again. All right. Is it at gmail.com and it's Kinsella? Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Yeah. Can you hear me okay or is it worse out here? Hey, Nolan, I can hear you. Okay, hi. Um, so I had another question not to do with intellectual property, but just a quick thing. I've heard you argue about uh, property rights from two different angles. First being, you know, the consequentialist, like we have property rights because it's the best way to, uh, you know, or the to avoid conflict pretty much instead of, you know, everybody fighting over resources that they can't allocate. Um, and then there's the also the argument of, you know, I control myself and therefore you know, or I have the, the, the best claim to it because I control myself and nobody else controls me. And then there's Rothbard's like, okay, all of these other possibilities don't exist and can't exist. So the only possibility left is that you own yourself. Is there, first of all, what's the best argument that you use to convince other people? And then are all of these, do you think perfectly valid or do you think one is better than another? I think they're, to the extent that they're sound, they're all trying to get at the same insight. Um, I think sometimes we have false false alternatives given to us with is it consequentialist or is it deontological? Um, I think those ways of framing it can be confusing. Um, and even saying we have rights, that's sort of thinking of them as some kind of moral fact that is exists. I tend to think of rights as normative principles or normative rules that can be justified. Okay, now how do we justify them? Um, I, I agree with the human idea that you cannot derive logically uh, a normative or an ought statement from a pure descriptive or a factory is statement, um, but you can derive them from, from other ought statements or other norms or values um, that, that either the community of people you're addressing all agree with or take for granted or that are undeniable, which is why I like argumentation ethics. So argumentation ethics shows you which base level values are basically un unassailable and undeniable because everyone has to presuppose them by virtue of engaging in, in peaceful discourse. Um, and so you, you proceed from those. So the way I think of property rights is, is, is the answer to a question. If you have a group of people that are engaged in discourse trying to find a set of rules to allow them to live together, right? And then they're necessarily trying to find rules that can be justified with reason and that could be accepted potentially by everyone in the argument as fair, which means they have to be universalizable. They can't be particularizable. They can't be just – I get to hit you and you can't hit me. That's just not – that's basically – if you fail to try to universalize, you're just not even engaging in argument. You're just you're just resorting – you're going back to might makes right, and you're not trying to solve the problem of conflict. So property rights are just the, the practical answer to the problem of conflict. How do we avoid conflict? Answer, we have property rights. What property rights do we have? Well, they have to be property rights that are based upon some – some rule that, that can be demonstrated as fair 
in a in a in a discussion among the participants that it, that the rule affects. And if you just go through the logic of it, especially because peace and mutual respect of each other's bodies is a presupposition of that argument, then the only rules that can come out of that are the libertarian rules because everything else is a socialistic rule which is incompatible with that. So the okay. only rule you could you, the only rule you could adopt would be number one self ownership because both people that are discussing um, presuppose control of their own bodies, and so they neither one wants to give up control of his body. So if they if they concede or they grant that or they claim that they have a right in their own body, in a discussion with another person who's 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 theoretically equal to them, right? That's why you're having a discussion because they're they're intellectually an equal. They're another actor like you are. So you must believe that you have rights in your body. For some reason, whatever that reason is, and unless you can point to to a difference in the other person's nature, you have to concede that for whatever basis that you have the right to your body, they have to have it too. So if you grant property rights in yourself, which you must in an argument, you can't deny that the other person has rights in their body. So that's why self-ownership comes out of that. Um, so for example, if I say that, well, slavery is natural. I get to own you, and you don't get to own me. Well, number one, that's particularistic, but also when I say I own you, I'm presupposing I own my own body because I have to be a self-owner to own a slave. But if I'm a self-owner, I'm a self-owner for some reason, and all we know in abstract about me is that I'm a, I'm a human actor, but the other guy's a human actor too. So it doesn't make sense for me to say I have rights in my body because I'm a human actor, and then you don't have rights because you, you're a human actor too, so you should. So – it's, to me, it's just a practical working out of all these concerns, and then you can go next to property rights, not really so much as an extension of the self-ownership, although Hoppe puts it that way in his, in his book, The Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, in chapter 7. Um, he calls the body a prototype of property rights, which we can use to apply to external resources, but it's more that… When you're having an argument with someone, as Hoppe recognizes, it's a practical affair requiring survival of the people, and because we're not ghosts and we're not immortal robots, that means we need to act. We need to move around in the world. We need to employ resources. You can't, you can't engage in an argument, which is a practical affair, without conceding that we have to employ scarce resources because everyone is using scarce resources every moment that they're alive. So you have to concede that people have to be able to use scarce resources if you're… If you're participating in an argument, which means that you have to recognize that there has to be a first use of an unowned resource, which means we have to – the first use of something that's not being used has to be permissible. But if it's permissible, and if you oppose might makes right and possession as the is the primary thing, then then the first user has to have a better claim than other people. Because if you didn't have a better claim than other people, you wouldn't have property rights at all. Because property rights imply what Hoppe calls the prior later distinction. It implies something special about having an earlier use of something than someone coming later. Right? That's what the entire search for property rights implies. It presupposes that prior is better than later because a property right establishes who has it now and gets to keep it until he gives it to someone else by consent. So when you kind of put all these things together, which are all basically undeniable in the context of a practical argumentation… The only thing that can pass that test, that series of filters, is the libertarian ethic because everything else is incompatible with all those presuppositions and those presupposed ideas. Anyway, okay. that's how I see it. So, can I jump okay, in? So, oh, oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. As far as a, a libertarian ethic or goes, do you, can you recommend any uh, authors to kind of put this in a blue collar way? Because I've tried reading a few of them, and um, it just um, – from my upbringing of uh, poverty, <laughs> the the issue I have with reading these guys is the act, the only natural law I've ever witnessed or seen is force. And so libertarian philosophy sounds good, a, and it's like it's something to live by. Yeah, that's I, actually like – that's I, a – that's a good question. Um, most you know of the I'm stuff, at, like I, I just can't. Yeah. To me, like these guys I read, and it's like you, it's a hard time of 
it seems like there are been yeah, in libraries their whole life and never there there are some i that i can i'll, I'll mention in a second um to get real precise on the terms like i'm talking now you would have to read like hoppa and some of my stuff and some of rothbard stuff um but to get the basic gist and what gets you aiming in that direction i would say maybe the best thing would be reading a very short book written in 1850 i think by frederick bastiat it's called the law i thought you were gonna say no treason <laughs> i tried <that>. no <laughs> yeah. no i definitely would not say I'm, I'm not a fan of spooner to be honest um not like like again like i get what he's getting at but like halfway through i'm like dude no that's first of all that's very legalistic he's going with con positive law of contract and all this stuff I think he's kind of right in that thing, but that's not about – no, I would read The Law by Bastiat. Start with The, the law. law by Bastiat. Okay. It's online for free everywhere, The Law. All right, yeah. I'll definitely um, that. that's, a really, that's a really good place to start. It's common sense. It's, it's very readable. Um, there's some others, but I would start with that. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely take your recommendation. Sorry I had to cut in, but uh, it's the okay. other guy. Yeah, go ahead. No, that's fine. Um, so that just actually, I can't bring you to the next question. That's why why is might is right wrong? Because it Lost can't me. be because it because it can't be argumentatively justified. See, you can't argumentatively justify might makes right because. You, to mount an argument, you have to do it in a peaceful context of discourse, of rational discourse. So you're already presupposing that might is not right because when you have a peaceful stance towards the other person, you're respecting his property right and his body. So the, you have to choose whether you're – like if you're trying to persuade someone of your, of, your, of your proposed norm or your claims to truth by giving evidence and reason and arguments, are you willing to – agree to disagree and let him walk away if he doesn't agree or are you coercing him like are you saying holding up a baseball bat and saying okay here's what i'm saying admit that i'm right or i'm going to kill you okay you can do that but that's not genuine argument you're not really trying to justify anything you're just trying to coerce someone into mouthing words which you're i see what you're able saying to do so it's, it's just not possible how to, do we obtain all this though obtain what libertarian society <laughs> like oh that's a whole different that's a whole different question uh well, well yeah uh i'm sorry uh, i don't mean to deter it well, just, that's kind of like I, I always get to in my mind I'll, when i read about philosophy. different different libertarians have different answers some people say you have to spread the word and hope you can persuade enough people to become aware of libertarian principles uh some people think by having a libertarian party some people think by moving to New Hampshire, <laughs> you know. Um, my answer is one that most libertarians don't like, and that's wait. W a i t. Wait. That's how you achieve it. Just because it's words, right, it'll prevail. This kind uh, of well, thing, or if if it prevails, it will have to prevail on its own force and naturally. It's not going to prevail because of the exhortations of of point. 0.3 percent of the population um <laughs> and so it will it will it will come about on its own so all we can do is wait maybe we can speed it up a little but i doubt it um uh, and then the, the, there's two answers one is wait and the other is buy your own freedom so if you're i mean to put it crudely if you're very wealthy and successful in a western econ economy country you have a lot of freedom i mean what's the purpose of freedom is to let you do what you want in your life, right? For sure. So if – imagine you're a billionaire. You can pretty much do what you want in your life, right? So you know, it's like would you rather be a billionaire in 2021 in a semi-free world, or would you rather be you know, a, a poor guy on a desert island where you're totally free? I mean you, know, you, you can basically buy your freedom, but to, to buy your freedom means you have to give up the activism and focus on a career, follow the rules of the status, and do what they say. And a lot of libertarians are, are pretty much uh, libertines or anti-authoritarians and contrarians and stubborn. What is li libertine? I've heard that term, and I'm just not 
too familiar like, with the space to know. Kind of hedonist. They care about partying and doing pot all the time. And oh, so not, legalized drugs is what they care about, kind of thing. Well, like we the, all believe we all believe in that, but I'm just saying oh no, no, they, definitely, definitely. But that that's where they come to. I'm just saying that they fun. they're they're what we call lifestyle libertarians. So they they're they're impatient to get liberty now. It's their passion, right? It's mine too. But I'm just saying, so, I think the only so way to high achieve, time preference libertarians. Um, no, I don't blame them for being. I don't blame them for being frustrated with not having liberty now. They're right. That's just that's just observing injustice and being rightly offended by it. Uh, I think what the problem is they're they're self delusional. They're unre They're they're not willing to be realistic. They don't want to grant that uh, there's little we can do. Um, li libertarian party types are really like this because they believe in democracy and all this stuff. And if you say I don't vote because it, you know what they'll. If you say I don't vote because it doesn't make a difference, then you know what they'll say. They'll say the brainwashed answer all the school kids have learned in, in from Schoolhouse Rock commercials. You know they'll say, well, if everyone said that, then you know. <laughs> They just repeat these things that they've heard over and over again because they don't want to. They don't want to admit that there's nothing you can do. But there is something you can do. You can you can make your own life better despite the state. You can you can treat the state. Look, we live in a world where life is precarious and dangerous, right? There's there's disease, there's shortages, there's hunger, um, there's war, there's there's wild animals. You know. Uh, and so we treat those as challenges that we have to overcome. Life is a struggle. So I just say it's better to classify the state as like a wild animal. That is another thing you have to overcome in life. And if they tax you 50% of your income, well, just make twice as much so that you're still the same as you would have been without the taxes. You know, It's not that fair that – excuse me? You know, uh, <laughs> the Dave Info. Smith and uh, a couple of people were just having a feud on, uh, I forgot, I think Ben Armani is the guy's name. And I think they said something like, just make more money when they were arguing against taxes. I didn't know if you were like purposefully referencing that. No, I was, I know, oh, okay. I know, I know, I know Vin and Dave Smith. I didn't, I'm not aware of this. Yeah. Which side said what? If you do, um, I think it was Vin Armani and then a couple of other guys were talking about how horrible Dave Smith was or something like that and how, you know, Vin was super. I know you went on like the little thing, but uh, Vin said something about how you should just make more money. Dave was, was like, Vin no, no. and uh, Matt Erickson from uh, that was it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, had discussion with Clint from Liberty Lockdown. That's where yeah. it all kind of came about. But yeah, their, their two sides was basically make more money then i don't mean to straw man either of them but it was the idea of uh basically like a pro-christianity route to libertyism and then matt is make more money until you can become king <laughs> what is argument well i and i'm not and, talking and, so, I, i'm not talking and, some Nietz some nietzschean thing i don't know what that is but um i, I don't yeah you're speaking about me there but um and and dave's point was Hey, I've made the money. You know, he, he makes good money, and this is what I decided to do with my time: is try to afford liberty. Yeah, and I, I do or, the same know. thing. I mean, I, yeah. I've I've been successful, and I use the money to to subsidize my my avocation of trying to develop libertarian theory and spread the word too. Um, but but all I'm saying is that the one reason we want liberty is that it makes our lives better and it gives us options. And all I'm saying is if the more successful you are in a given society, then the more of those options that you have. So one way for you to personally get – if you're impatient and you want liberty, well, then buy your liberty. I mean that, that is one thing you can do. I'm not, I'm not criticizing activism or diminishing it. Uh, I'm simply saying there, there is a way to achieve liberty in your life, which is to, to be careful about not – don't get sent to prison. You know. Observe the rules. You know, you know. I don't think that drug laws are right, but I wouldn't run around selling cocaine, even though I have the perfect right to under libertarian law because I don't want to go to prison. Wait, I'm kind of curious about that. Sorry, could I stop you real fast? Sure. About going to a uh, prison. If like you were drafted or if somebody was drafted, I know you probably you probably can't legally advise people to like avoid the draft. Do you think there's an argument that can be made there? Well, obviously there's an argument, but. 
Like, does that, does that make sense? Like, obviously you shouldn't go run around selling heroin, even though that would be what should be right. But what about, you know, like draft dodging? Well, in, in t well, that's why I said in today's society in the West, I mean, we, right now we don't have that problem. So we're kind of lucky that if you just carefully skirt the rules and you, you can, you can, you can succeed if you, if you have a little bit of fortune and, and, and you can, but if you're faced with things like that, sometimes you can't, which is horrible. Um, Gotcha. I I have I I say there is no moral. Well, I won't say moral, but there's no there's no obligation, there's no libertarian obligation to obey positive law. Um, I think you have a right to evade and to violate any state law that is unjust, like the yeah. draft. But whether it's prudent is a different question. Um, that's a question. It's hard to decide sometimes. Um, I think I, I would, you know, if my son were to be drafted, I would move to Canada to, to escape it or something like that. Sure. B bribe the draft board. I don't know. You know, uh, if they, if they put you in a situation where you're facing two different types of horrible penalties, like one is going to war and dying maybe, and the other is risking going to prison by evading the law. I mean, what are you going to do? You got to, yeah, you got to try to do the best you can. But again, if you if you were a billionaire, you could probably buy your way out of it. Fair enough. You know, we might have to jump in real quick. Go ahead. Uh, as far as uh, evading uh, that uh, the drugs and getting caught up and all that and trying to make more money, um, something that's very <laughs> personal to me in the sense that I've had drug charges. And it, I don't know what kind of reach you have as far as people listen to your podcast, but um, anybody in that scenario, get your CDL. I have drug charges, and I'm on track to make about 180 this year. So what's CDL? Get your CDL. Uh, commercial driver's license. What's it got to do with? Oh, it's like a trucking thing. So right? you're saying Isn't that, that the kind of license you need? To uh, I was just trying to throw out a tip to anybody out there with a drug charge thinks their life is hopeless. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. Yeah, no, that's yeah, a good point. Your, yeah, get your CDL. <laughs> there's there's a, a good life for as far as, or I don't know about life, but good income that can come. And by the way, way yeah. it's not just getting rich, it's the opposite too. You could live very frugally, like a lot of these nomad type libertarians do. And so that you don't have much to lose. I mean, or so that you don't, you know, you can live for, I don't know, 30, 40, 50,000 a year pretty well if you live extremely frugally and you're kind of self-sufficient that's another way to go too oh yeah for sure it's just um when you're talking about drug charges that mm -hmm. tug on my heartstrings that's something i've dealt with and and i've been able to i guess turn my life around in the sense of getting a blue collar job but still provides very well for my family and just wanted to that's throw that's that out as an option to whoever's listening i, I actually uh I, I, in my whole life, I've never voted Democrat except um, about two years ago. There was a mayoral election in Houston, and I had met this guy named Dwight something, black guy running for mayor, Democrat. He he ran. He came in fourth or fifth, but when I met him, we were talking, and one of his big things was he was his goal was to try to get the city government to basically give opportunities to released felons. And I thought that was the best thing in the world because I really feel for all these people that their lives are basically ruined by a bullshit uh, you know, conviction by the state. Um, so anything we can do to uh, you know, undo the harm that's done to these guys, you know, they're unemployable quite often, right? Yeah. So I actually voted for the guy for that. So just because I was like, you know, that's one solid issue I can get behind. Of course, he lost. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry to deter the conversation, but I just wanted to throw that out there to whoever's listening. But the reason I said wait is I actually do think liberty's coming. Um, I think as we get richer and we get more cosmopolitan and as technology gets better and better and better, like the internet, cell phones, and now Bitcoin. I think this, the, the state's just going to slowly become more and more irrelevant, so we'll kill it by attrition. It'll basically truncate to be what the British monarchy is. You know, It's still there, but it's just like a showpiece. But yeah, are we, we just trading the government for a technocracy? 
at this point? No, I'm 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 um, imagining a decentralized thing where everyone like you know if you you might have a robot doctor in your basement and your robot your robot 3D printer can print your cell phone and build you a car and you can you can build your little robots that'll go out and build your house and you'll have a little nuclear machine in the backyard that makes your power uh you know and so everyone's going to be so rich and self sufficient in this post scarcity kind of society or or this super abundant society um crime will crime will just dissipate you won't need welfare people will be rich so all the things that the government claims to do for us the problems they they claim to solve will cease to become problems now this is my utopian sort of hope but all if that's going to happen all we can do is wait that's why i said wait and it might take 100 years but i think it's coming that's what i'm I, that's what i'm curious about cuz like if hoppa and you know democracy the god that failed he's talking about moving from monarchy to democracy as a regression not a progression and that you're moving to more you know public forms of government and getting worse why wouldn't that be the case i mean if people's time preferences say are so altered that you know every a lot more people have higher time preferences especially in a public governance why wouldn't they set up a more totalitarian version of that i just like think if social would... democracy collapses because they because they because they i think there's two reasons the, and this is my this is my own this is my own little cranky theory on this. Number one, they'll be less able they'll be less able to because people will become more and more powerful with their own technology and their own wealth. They'll just you mean like the minority? Just everyone. Everyone in society okay. will become more powerful. It'll be you know, it's like it's it's sort of like in if everyone if everyone had their own Uzi, then it might be harder for the government to go to everyone's houses and take their gold, you know, it's just as a practical matter. Uh, as a as a crude example, um, and, okay. and 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 the second reason is um, um, the state does exist on on propaganda to some degree, and the propaganda is that the state is necessary because without the state, we're going to have chaos. So we won't have roads. People will die of insufficient health care. You won't be able to have any money for your retirement. Mm -hmm. Uh, you won't be able to have protection from criminals and bad guys overseas. But if those things all recede naturally because we're just a wealthier, more technologically powerful people, then the government's message will start becoming more and more hollow. Government says we need to take half of your income to defend you from criminals, and you're like, well, I have like an impregnable, impregnable fortress with nano robot swarms. Monitoring it all the time and lasers ready to zap anyone who crosses my border. What do I need you for, you know? And healthcare is like five dollars a year now because we have post scarcity, you know, and we have AI and robots and and all this plentifulness. Then what's the government going to say? Well, we you need us to have government schools. It's like, well, there's the internet and there, there's there's all, there's all these private solutions people are using, which are fine and they're cheap. It's just the excuses, the government's excuses are going to run thin. I mean, anyway, that's my kind of hope because I don't see the other solutions where I don't think the Libertarian Party is going to elect president and usher in freedom in the world. I don't think us Libertarians handing out pamphlets to to uncles at Thanksgiving is going to change the world. All right, fair enough. So if that's not going to work, then we're screwed. So I can only hope that it's going to come about naturally and inevitably. All right. Well, I mean, I got a, I got a question about uh, economics. If, if everybody else doesn't have anything else to ask. Sure, go ahead. And then I got to go in about five or ten minutes, but go ahead. All right. But so I, I'm guessing you've read, read Man, Economy, and State. Yeah. Okay. So in you know chapter ten he's talking about monopoly and com and mm -hmm. competition, mm -hmm. and uh, he goes into this long thing about you know in, about um, you know setting up the monopoly price now that whole thing is illusory and everything. Correct. Um, you know cartels they 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 tend to break apart and everything and I get all that and then it, all that makes total sense. The the issue that I have then is he goes and talks about labor unions and he's talking about how they're harmful and that um, and I, I mean I don't want to like labor unions in any way but. He's talking about how, you know, they, they artificially set a price higher than what would be otherwise the equilibrium if it were, you know, between individual competitors. And that, you know, that would drive other laborers out of the market who wouldn't have otherwise been there. 
my question is why is that different from what a cartel could potentially do by setting up a quote unquote monopoly price? Like why is that labor union price concrete yeah. to him, but not um, unlike the monopoly yep. price, which is yep. uh, goes back and forth. I haven't read that lately, but I'm pretty, I'm, I think I remember it. I, I, I think I have the right answer to that question. It's a good question, mm -hmm. and I think the answer is um, if he was talking about labor unions on a free market, you would be right. He'd be, he would be making an argument that's inconsistent with his claims that cartels can't, can't arise on a free market. Um, yes, yeah, no, I get that. Yeah. He's talking no, about have, labor no. unions that have the benefit of state force. So the, yes. he's basically saying that, okay. that the state lets them basically use coercion or violence against the scabs or against the or, – or the law basically forces employers to negotiate in good faith with a labor union. So that's the reason why it causes a distortion is because the, the law is behind them. So if they, if they were just negotiating freely on the – like if it was a pure free market and the government did not force employers um, to negotiate with labor unions, and if they weren't given legal basically immunity for – for hurting people to cross picket lines, then whatever they negotiated with the employer would be a free market result, and it would not be um, driving costs artificially up or anything. Okay, so that's I, I get that part because he does say in there that he's not advocating for force in any means against the people who are voluntarily deciding to join a labor union or the people who are deciding not to break the strike. But he still asserts that it's wrong to form labor unions and that it is inefficient. Even I think when he I, I, recognizes I, I, that it's voluntary, I'd have. To, I don't. I, I don't think he says that. I'd have to read it. Again. Oh, he I doesn't. Think he, I think he's talking about labor unions that are formed uh, with the support with the help of state law. I think that's what he's referring to. Okay, so that that that's what I would think because that I think makes a lot of sense as far as that goes, especially with what he said. But it's just right afterwards he says he he says explicitly, "I'm not for using force," you know, because of. Dude, that would be wrong. I mean, it would be. I'm not talking wrong. about. I'm not talking about his. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. his. His saying that he wouldn't use force against him. I'm talking about his claim that the intervention of labor unions artificially drive up prices and cause inefficiency. He must yeah. there only be referring to labor unions that have a. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I know what artificial, you're saying. An artificial role because of the existence of state law. No, I get what you're saying, but the problem is after he talks about that, you know, explicit force thing, he says it's we see people. He, he talks about how there's like a social stigma with not breaking strikes, and that you know it, that that that's harmful. Really? And well, that, I would. Yes, I would just, that's what I would. He, I would disagree okay. with that then, but I don't remember okay. him saying that. Um, yeah, I, I, I would grab the book, but I've got a whole bunch of people sleeping inside this <laughs> condo. But I'm pretty sure he has a quote in there specifically that says uh, that. Um, well, if you, why don't you look it up and send okay, it to me later? What? We'll, we'll take a I'm look gonna at grab it. it. I'm going to grab it right now. Hey, Stephen, while he's doing that, uh, you might have reminded me of that book that I should read. The, the Law. The, the law. law. All right. By Bastiat. B A S T I A T. All right. The Law. Thank you, sir. It's probably free on Mises.org. M I S E S.org. It's free on yep. the yeah, Bastiat. Bastiat.org, cool. too, I think. Um, Sweet. Yeah, I got it on Google right now. I just wanted to save it. Sent, I forgot. Go ahead. I sent an email to uh, Bob Murphy, too, but he has not gotten back to me. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, he's he's busy. I'm um, guessing. Yeah, no, I get that. I, I'm not expecting any <laughs> return. That's fine. But I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up too here while we're talking. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, because I'm curious now because I'm pretty sure I see uh, he's one of the few people that's really good on monopoly theory. And Hoppe, Hoppe, I think chapter ten of Hoppe's book also is a really good discussion of monopoly um okay i'm looking at man economy state now yeah okay i've got the quote i think is yeah, it chapter it's, 10 it's, it's chapter 10 it would be section i don't know i mean it's section a of i think like seven or something uh section well, four section i'm looking let me find it yeah. in my section four labor unions okay yeah labor unions okay yeah section yeah. four of chapter 10 okay it, it, on my book, it's page 712. 
but basically he says the economist qua economist can have no quarrel with a man who voluntarily comes to the conclusion that it's more important to preserve union solidarity than to have a good job. But there is one thing an economist can do. He can point out to the worker the consequences of his voluntary decision. There are undoubtedly countless numbers of workers who do not realize that their refusal to cross a picket line, their sticking to the union may result in their losing their jobs and remaining unemployed. Oh, yeah. I think that's true. I think I think. Oh, no, I 100 percent. Yeah, I think what he's pointing out is that uh, there are consequences of even forming a free market union. Uh, it's risky, and you know you have to pay dues to the union if nothing else. So there's a cost there. Definitely, I I think I might be conflating it with what he said earlier. Yeah, is the thing. I think it's because I don't know if he's trying to say, look, even when people do it voluntarily, it's still a, a an artificially high price. I guess it's he could he couldn't be right. I mean, there's no way that that would. But make what any you sense. you might be you might be sensing there a sort of a sort of hostility toward of Rothbard towards unions. Even that's free yeah, market that's market. exactly it. Uh, which I guess I would disagree with. Like whatever would arise on a free market would have to be fine, but in today's society, like we have this art of it's sort of like COVID. It's like yeah, employers are requiring people to be vaccinated. And you can say that's private, and it is, but but would they be doing that if, if there wasn't this massive government propaganda campaign kind of forcing them to do it? Um, yeah, but so, I mean Rothbard isn't so much claiming that the government is the thing that's propagandizing people. He's claiming that the labor unions themselves are getting people to think in a certain way, and I know he says that explicitly. Yeah, He doesn't he say that the state is doing it. Yeah, his hostility towards them might be because he's he's just picturing the ones that exist now, which are all kind of distorted and propped up by the state and full probably of kind of leftist labor theory of value rhetoric and and also this this failure to appreciate the role of the capitalist in actually providing jobs and money for the laborers and maybe he thinks they're going too far, but I think that's probably deviating from his role as an economist if he does that. Maybe maybe he goes too far there. I don't know. I'd have to reread that part. All right. Awesome. I appreciate it. That solves a lot. But read Hop. Hop read Hop. I don't really know. Papa talks about labor unions, but Hoppe's short chapter on monopoly is also really good. And I think it's in theory of socialism and capital, or maybe the sec second book. I think it's in that one, though. All right. That, that'll go to the list. I've got too many to, to read at the moment. Hop is, Hop is way shorter than – if you want some suggestions, yeah. I'll tell you what I think. I wouldn't read Man, Economy, State, or even Human Action like first. <laughs> Dude, I'm on page 780. I'm, well, I'm it's so good. Actually, uh, Power and Market is even better, I think, that the second so that's in, part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's in the Omnibus okay. edition, but it's the second book sometimes. But um, okay. what I would read would be Hoppe's two books, which are both very short, The Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, and the, sec the second one, Economics and Ethics of Private Property. And as far mm -hmm. as Mises, I, my favorite book by his is his last book, The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science. It's short, and it's really huh. about – it's about methodology, which to me is the, the distinguishing feature and the best part, the most interesting part of Austrian economics. Uh, I've never heard anybody say that that was their favorite Mises book, but I'll, I'll check it out. Um, do you have any – do you prefer um, – would you say to read Bomb Ball work or Manger if you had to pick one? I guess I don't know. I wouldn't pick. <laughs> um, oh, okay. I mean, I, what I love, I mean, Menger for the kind of the, the economics and the and the foundations of Austrian, but Bombovark has some great stuff blending economic with sort of um, like legal analysis. Like he's got this thing called uh, what's the Bombovark book? It's a it's a collection of essays. Um, mm -hmm. let's see here. Anyway, there's, an, uh, there's a chapter in there about how you classify goods. Let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, oh, it's called Shorter Classics. Shorter Classics okay. by Bob Bar It's hard to find online. I, I pirated it somewhere. But it's it's the essay um, – hell, hold on a second. I'll share my screen. I'll just read the whole thing if it's small enough. It's just I have to read. I'm reading this, and then it's going to be the Ethics of Liberty and then Anarchist Handbook, and then enough already. Mm. It's not letting me share my screen. Hold on. 
uh, I'll say, but it's, it's chapter. Um, well, I'm just telling you, if you want to know, I, I think for Bob Buffer, yeah, gotcha. I love this book, Shorter Classics. And it's the second chapter, whether legal rights and relationships are economic goods. That's fascinating. Okay. Um, and I actually want to extend, I want to extend that and build on it someday because that's a something that needs to be used. Uh, but Manger, I actually haven't read a lot of Manger. Um, from what I understand about what he's written, like I, I want to go back myself and study more of his money, his monetary stuff. Although I think it's been sort of surpassed by some of the later writers they built on it. But um, I understand a lot of what he wrote is becoming having renewed relevance for for the, the way we're trying to understand Bitcoin. I have one more quick question for you then. Because Tom was posting this big long thing about how Hayek wasn't worth reading. Do you believe in it? Do you agree with him or no? Tom said that? Tom, yeah, Tom and his MeWe group. Yeah, he said uh, some of, he, he wrote a big long thing about how Hayek was really not worth reading. There was one book of his that uh, he recommended only kind of, but only after you read a bunch of other stuff. I didn't. I didn't realize he had those views. That's similar to my own. I'm not a big Hayek fan. Um, yeah. Well, I know Hoppe isn't, but. So. Well. I, Is it I just understand because that, other authors go in better detail on those subjects? But Hayek. Well, I, so my my take on Hayek is, um, I understand he's really good on capital theory, like as a pure economic contribution. But I've never read that. So, other than capital theory. My take on Hayek is this. First of all, he's not a libertarian. Everyone assumes he's a libertarian. He's not. Um, mm -hmm. Walter Block has detailed that, um, and so is Hoppe, I think. Um, and he's also a bit of a dilettante, so he, he kind of shifts from one thing <laughs> to another over his career. He's right behind um, you. <laughs> he's not systematic, um, and… He is not a praxeologist. That one reason I recommended the Mises book is because I love his praxeology, and that's what I'm, Hayek is not. Hayek has some good critiques of scientism, but his business cycle theory, which is mostly sound, is just representing what Mises did. So I think Hoppe and others have said to the extent Hayek is good, he's it's because he's just he's just restating what Mises said, and to the extent he's original, he's wrong. And uh, I, I think he goes off base with his explanation of socialist cal socialist calculation problems. I think me, you know, Joe Salerno and others have dehomogenized. They've they've done this thing called dehomogenization. They've shown that we we should stop assuming Hayek and Mises are kind of two 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 sides of the same coin. They just have a different approach, and Hayek is basically misguided and wrong. I wouldn't say don't read him. Uh, I think the road to serfdom can be bracing for someone who is not that libertarian yet. Um, but his longer books, like uh, 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 what's the the Constitution of Liberty and Law, Legislation, and Liberty, like are all over the map. And um, I don't know. That's I'm I'm I wouldn't put a Hayek anywhere anywhere on my top list of books to recommend. Yeah. But I, I know, know I have a lot of economy. a lot of a lot of my friends are aghast that I would say that. Well, I mean, in man economy and state, I swear Rothbard is like only criticizing Hayek, and <laughs> I mean he he pulls out like one thing of his that he likes, but I don't know. I found it kind of I wasn't expecting the criticism of Hayek, and like I swear every other chapter. Well, I think he was bad on methodology, mm -hmm. and although he was good on crit criticizing scientism. But his own methodology, I don't know what it is, uh, but it's not praxeology. And 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 I think he's bad on this knowledge paradigm stuff. I think that's uh, that's it's a it's a mis it's it's the wrong path to have gone down. And um, he's got a lot of unlibertarian things he says. I guess I'd say the best thing to read by him would be um, the Road to Serfdom, and also. If you want to be aware, like as a scholar, aware of the whole Mises, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the economic calculation problem, read his take on it and his knowledge stuff. I think it's – I think he – I think it's kind of wrong, but it's important to know it if you want to be a kind of an intellectual or scholarly educated libertarian. Mm -hmm. That's my take on it, but it, everything's idiosyncratic. That's just my personal take. I'll say his best writings are price and production. That was before moving to the LSE 
and abandoning praxeology. So that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could be. And probably that's a lot of Mises What happened to stuff. him was he, he moved to the London School of Economics and met Karl Popper. And then, I don't know, he, he abandoned praxeology. He even criticized it in multiple times. So. Right. right. Um, there. But before there, his writings were really good. At least I like them. Yeah, you could be right. Um I focus everything... more. I, I focus more on the on the on the law because I was a law, a law student and I was I read yeah. the law of legislative liberty, constitutional liberty. Oh, Erky sucks. He's really bad. But his economic writings, especially those before 1935, are really good. I really recommend them. Okay, well, that's a vote for that. What? Uh, what? Other than your own book, what books would you recommend? What, what's your top three books if you had to pick three? Oh, it really depends on libertarian the wise, obviously. Not like well, I've, you know, I've, I've got a, uh, and I'll, I'll, I, I got to go after this, but um, I've got a, an article I wrote. It's like the greatest libertarian books. And so I have my own list. And I also link in there to a couple of bibliographies that have good suggestions. One's by Hoppe, Anarcho Capitalism Bibli Bibliography. Uh, if you go to my website, Stephan Casella, you'll see uh, – just l go to my uh, LLW page. Look for the greatest libertarian books or something like that. Um, let's see. So, of course, there's some Ayn Rand, but that's more you know, entree or inspirational. Um, Economics in One Lesson, The Free Market Reader, Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom, um, Hoppe's two, first two books in English. Um, Rothbard, The Ethics of Liberty, Mises' Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, and also Theory and History, and also Socialism. Like, I would read those three instead of or before human action. Um, what about, uh, economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth. Is that something you think is? Oh, yeah, yeah. But that, but that, but, okay. but that's in, that's in socialism. That's in the book. That's expanded. In oh, okay. Socialism. Um, so he wrote that essay in 1920 or 21, and then he wrote the book Socialism in like, I don't know, 1929 or something, which was a whole treatment of that and other aspects of socialism. Um, of course, The Law by Bastiat. And, oh, The Market for Liberty by the Tannehills. David Friedman's The Machinery of Freedom. Uh, the Structure of Liberty by Randy Barnett. Um, Bruce Benson's... Um, Bruce Benson's the uh, uh, forgetting the title now. His his uh, his books on free markets and law or something like that. Um, I just did a blog post. What's the it called? The Enterprise of Law. The Enterprise of Law. That's it. Yeah, the Enterprise of Law. Um, there was I just if you go to my site, uh, just Google Michael Malice because you know Malice just had this nice little handbook, the Anarchist Handbook. Yeah, and no, I'm reading when I, Yeah, it's and that's a nice collection. And I, I, when I was reading, I thought, oh, he left out A, B, C, and D, like, or he left out the following things I would include. So I did a blog post saying, here's the, here's, here's like supplemental readings for that. So that includes a lot of in, interesting anarchist-related works that um, could be in a companion volume to his book. Are they more libertarian and are right anarchists more so than they are left? Um, in your recommendations almost all yeah okay except maybe for uh molinari which i can't remember if he was left or right but molinari um but you know also like uh sam conkin who i guess was a left anarchist of a sort um, who i would put on the list um But there were some there are some left ones I would include, but Malice already included them, like Benjamin Tucker and um, people like that. I would not have included Emma Goldman mm -hmm. and those types, but that's just not my cup of tea, or that's not my that's not my path. Uh, uh, I know you got to go, but can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go Stephen. Ahead. Uh, as far as left versus right anarchism, I'm obviously not well read in, in any of all this, but um, to me, anarchism is without rulers. How can it be left or right? Like, what's the distinction there? Like, to me, it's just personal choice is basically the dumbing down of anarchism to two words. 
Like, how can there be a left versus right? Anar- anarchism. Well, I mean, uh, there's like yeah, too long winded. Uh, there's, <laughs> there. there, there's like five or six types of, of anarchy, too. I mean, um, I mean, in one sense, like if you read Alfred Kuzan's great classic essay, uh, Do We Ever Really Get Out of Anarchy? It's in the early, maybe the first issue of the Journal of Libertarian Studies, which would be on my list, by the way. It's on my list. Um, he points out that, you know, we already have anarchy. In the world because we have anarchy between states already yeah and even within a given state it's in a state of anarchy itself because no one person can tell everyone else what to do like so is left right anarchy versus like the state or how states interact versus personal anarchy because like i I define anarchy as a personal i think uh, i think I, i think left means it's a combination of what they would like to evolve, develop on a private free market um, and what they predict would evolve. So like the left anarchists would say that, okay, some of the, some of the good left anarchists like Roderick Long and these guys who are solid libertarian anarchists, they want there to be private property rights respected in a, in a, in a government free, in a state free society. But they predict and would prefer that there be fewer employee employee employer relationships and, and less capitalism, whereas the right anarchists want and predict that if you let a, a, the free market run wild, you would have capitalism in the sense of large industries dominated by concentrated. Uh, so, so it's just a prediction of where it goes to. It's not uh, a, a prescription on personal rights. Well, it, it, it's, right. they're not always they're not always as clear as I'm trying to be. I I think the best way to understand it is a prediction and a personal preference. Like, but if it's personal but that, preference, but not prescription. Well, sometimes they do that too. Like, uh, but but the, so the right good, would allow left, but left would allow right, kind of thing. Cor- correct, except for the good the good left guys would would not use force to stop a right anarchist enclave from arising but some of these left anarchists will flat out say that it's a violation of property rights to um profit like or to, <laughs> to have profit yeah to have profit <laughs> off of your employees or to have employees or to be an absentee owner of a, of a factory or or you know an apartment complex you know where you have tenants so they would actually so I think they're actually advocating socialism because they don't respect property rights. They actually think that that in a free market, you should not respect certain types of property rights. So it's, it has to do with an issue of priorities. Then, if you prioritize the the state being abolished over you know capitalism being abolished, you're probably a good anarchist. But if it were the other way around, you wouldn't be. Yeah, and the left, some of the left guys. Okay can't help but thinking of capitalism as inextricably intertwined with the state like they think there would not be capitalism in a in an anarchy and therefore because we do have capitalism it's just a creature of the state so it's not natural so they would never call for anarcho capitalism because they think that you can't have capitalism without state support Mm -hmm. like the the privileges of corporate incorporation like limited liability that kind of stuff All right, guys. Well, I, I need to run, but uh, appreciate your time, sir. I appreciate you guys. Yeah, appreciate Thank you it. guys jumping in and asking intelligent right, civil questions. You before, so if you have time to take that out. Feel free to. Thanks, guys. Okay. Good evening.